welcome and thank you for joining us this evening for our Star Stories program with NASA Solar System Ambassador David Jarkins. He will be discussing the stories behind the various constellations and asterisms in the sky. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them in the chat and David will get to them at the end. And we ask that you please keep your devices muted until the end of the presentation. So thank you for that. David? Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Charlie. I appreciate it. Uh, when Charlie and I were talking about this presentation, um, trying to come up with a theme, uh, the theme that the library has at this point is tales and tales. So it seemed like the most appropriate thing uh, was to talk about some of the star stories that various cultures tell themselves and the rest of the world about what's going on in the sky. So I'm gonna share my screen here and we will get started. Okay. So as Charlie mentioned, I am a NASA Solar System Ambassador. The Solar System Ambassadors are part of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology. We're a volunteer organization and we provide uh, outreach to the public uh, for uh, different scientific things uh, and this presentation is one of those. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I'm a member of the Springfield Astronomical Society. So if you're in the Springfield area and looking for an astronomy club, uh, please visit our website uh, for more information. For thousands of years, people have told stories and set them in the stars. Some stories were practical knowledge that tried to explain what was happening up in the sky. Uh, some were timekeeping stories uh, to know when you needed to do various things. Some are basically myths and legends. And many names were given to the objects in the sky, the stars, the constellations. Some of those names are so old that the actual origins of them are lost uh, in the mists of time and we have no idea what they really mean. If you look at a modern star chart like one here, uh, it, the first thing that you're gonna notice is the name of the stars. The majority of these names are Arabic in nature. Some of the names make sense uh, and in the constellation Perseus, which is the one we're looking at here, there's a star named Algol and you can see that uh, right here, you've got this star called Elgol. Uh, Elgol is an uh, Arabic word. It uh, means the head of the ghoul or the head of the demon. And it's commonly known as the demon star. So why in the world would ancient people name this a demon star? Well, every 20 hours and nine minutes, this star gets very dim and then it gets uh, bright again. And in some cultures, they thought that perhaps there was some demon that was causing the star to wink. What we know today is that Elgol is actually an eclipsing binary star. So every 20 hours and nine minutes, there's a dim star that's in orbit around the, the bright star. And as it passes in front of it, it causes it to dim and then it gets brighter again. And one of the very interesting things about this star is that this is uh, visible during Halloween. So if you can remember this, you can go out at Halloween and look for the star and you'll see it get dimmer and brighter. Uh, other practical uses of stars are for uh, calendars, keeping track of what month uh, it is and what's going on up in the sky. This particular drawing is actually a copy of the roof in an Egyptian tomb. Senemet was a high official in the court of Hatshepsut, uh, Egypt's most successful female pharaoh. And I apologize for murdering that uh, name. And I'm gonna do that quite often to this presentation because there's a lot of names that I am not very familiar with. Uh, so this was uh, the, uh, the ceiling in that tomb. And as Egyptians were dedicated astronomers, uh, this is one of the things that they created uh, in the ceiling of this tomb. Over on the left, you see some various figures uh, down here, and you see some text. These figures uh, are lists of planets and stars known as deacons uh, to the Egyptians. 
And then the circles, the 12 circles over on this side, those are divided up into uh, 24 segments for each hour of the day. And each one of those circles is for each one of the months of the year. So they had uh, different months assigned to different uh, deities and uh, they had different drawings for each one of these things. Uh, some of the other practical uses uh, is, uh, is what they used for the Pleiades. So this is a NASA picture of the Pleiades. This is a, a winter uh, star cluster. Uh, the Tarek Berbers of the Northern Sahara use the star cluster as a calendar element to know when the hot dry season is starting and when the cold wet season is starting. And to remember it, they had a proverb. And it went that when the Pleiades fall, I wake looking for my goatskin bag to drink. When the Pleiades rise, I wake looking for clothes to wear. And what that means is when the Pleiades fall with the sun in the west during April, they know that the, high, uh, the hot dry summer is coming. And when the Pleiades rise in the morning in November, they know that the cold rainy season is coming. And so they're going to have to gather up their clothes to, to stay warm. So some very practical uh, stories that they told about that. In addition to the practical applications, uh, people obviously have used names to track the stars and they also told stories and they set those stories in the night sky. So if you look at any kind of star chart or if you use an application on a phone some, or a tablet, something like that, they'll, they'll always show constellations. And the official constellations that we recognize and that you'll hear used commonly are managed by uh, a group called the International Astronomical Union. In the early 1900s, the scientific community decided that there was uh, a wide array of different people that had different constellations and where those boundaries were, were very confusing. So in 1930, they had one of their uh, scientists actually sit down and definitively tell where the constellations were and where their boundaries were. And those are the constellations that we use today. Uh, there's 88 constellations as the uh, IAU has described. Uh, more than half of those have ancient Greek uh, mythology roots. And the ancient Greeks took those constellations and stories from Babylonians, Egyptians, Assyrians. They took it from those uh, cultures. But those cultures actually took them from someone else. And we know that uh, there are star charts in some caves that go back 17,000 years. Uh, the illustration shows here is far more recent than that. Uh, but this is one of the oldest star charts in existence. This came out of China. I, it comes from a cave in Dunhua. Uh, it is the sky as depicted around the North Pole. And if you look at this, you can see down here in the bottom about the only thing you're gonna recognize out of all these constellations is this one right here, uh, what we would call the Big Dipper. And that is really, as I looked at it, one of the few constellations that we would recognize. Um, it's the, like I said, it's the oldest surviving star map that we have. And the uh, Chinese used a far uh, smaller constellations than what we're used to. Uh, this is a reproduction of the Chinese star maps. They have, where we have 88 constellations, they have 283 constellations. Um, and they're made up of 1400 stars large number of small constellations makes it possible for them to reference a very small area of the sky without using what we use to uh, navigate the, the sky, which is right ascension and declination coordinates. So uh, they're, they're able to talk about a constellation and they know very specifically what part of the sky they're talking about. Each of these drawings around the edge also have uh, a great deal of significance to the Chinese people. The black tortoise represents both north and the winter. It's a symbol of longevity. Uh, the tortoise of the north is often depicted together with a snake and the union of these two creatures were thought to have created the earth. 
The blue dragon represents both east and the spring. The dragon is generally considered to be both benevolent and auspicious. It is also often associated with the emperor and therefore linked to the red bird, which you see at the bottom, who is associated with the empress. The red, the red bird represents the south in summer, and the bird sometimes seen as a, is sometimes seen as a phoenix and is associated with good fortune. And it's often paired with the dragon, as you would imagine. The white tiger represents the west and the autumn. Tiger is often seen as a protector and thought to guard over the armies of the emperor and the spirits of the dead. So this chart is probably the most well-known constellation uh, and its name is Ursa Major, the Great Bear. Most of you are gonna recognize the Big Dipper, which is actually an asterism. Uh, an asterism is a group of stars that doesn't make up an entire constellation. So the Big Dipper is actually a small portion of Ursa Major. So Ursa Major is a winter constellation and Ursa Major in Greek is Great Bear. Uh, in the Greek story, here's a drawing of the great bear. Greek story, Callisto is ravaged by Zeus and bears a son, Arcus. Hera, the wife of Zeus, realizes what happened and throws Callisto to the ground. As Callisto lays on the ground, dark hair sprouts from her entire body. Her hands and feet become claws and her mouth become gaping jaws. For 15 years, Callisto roamed the forest as a bear. One day she sees her son, Arcus, and approaches. Arcus doesn't know that this is his mother and he starts to back away. Zeus is watching over this and he fears for Callisto. He's afraid that Arcus is gonna attack Callisto and he creates a whirlwind and hurls both of them into the sky where he turns Callisto into Ursa Major and Arcus into another constellation called Bootes. Hera is outraged that now Callisto is now glorified in the stars. And she consults with Tithus and Oceanus, the gods of the sea and her foster parents. And she persuades them to let Callisto never bathe in northern waters, which keeps the great bear above the horizon. So if you watch the horizon from the latitude of Greece, uh, you'll see that uh, the great bear never dips below the horizon to keep, uh, to keep her um, from... Uh, from bathing in the northern waters. Uh, the Sami people look at this, uh, they're indigenous to uh, Norway and they see a bow and arrow of a great hunter. In Hawaii, the stars of the handle are vertebrae and a backbone and this line of stars is used extensively in navigation. Some Mongolian star see, gazers see seven Buddha when they look at this constellation. The Ojibwe saw a type of weasel called a fisher instead of a bear. And you can see the Big Dipper in the constellation of the fisher. The fisher's appearance signaled the time as a time to tap trees for syrup. So they used this also to know when spring was coming and it was time to start tapping uh, the trees in their area to get syrup out of it. The Egyptians saw a crocodile. And you can see the Big Dipper here, it's upside down from what we would normally see it. Uh, the Egyptians saw a crocodile instead of a bear. Uh, the district of Upper Egypt corresponds with the crocodile. And at the time when uh, El Qaeda of Versa Major, which is the last star here in the constellation or in this asterism, when that was at its highest point, that corresponded with the birth of Sobek, the crocodile god, on December 28th. And when it was in its lower collimation, or when it was the other way, then that corresponded to uh, the day of the cutting out of the god of Sobek, the, the day of the cutting out of the tongue of Sobek, the crocodile god, on March 29th. And then at the other end of this is another star that they uh, attributed a great deal of significance to, uh, this is uh, Musida, which is Latin for muzzle. Uh, and that star, as it uh, traveled around, also had very significant uh, meaning to them. On September 8th, uh, it marked the setting when Musida was setting. That was the tongue of Sobek, 
Uh, and that corresponded to another uh, fe festival that they had at that time. Uh, in the ancient Norse, Norse people of Europe, uh, the night sky was a mysterious realm, sometimes viewed as a magnificent world tree that stretched across the sky, where the stars were fruit upon its spreading branches and the Milky Way was its massive roots that extended down into earth. As the story of the world tree goes, there is an eagle that you can see right here. So they've got an eagle that sits in the branches of the ash and it had knowledge of many things. Between its eyes sits a hawk. And that hawk, Verdflener, uh, sits between his eyes. A squirrel called Ratatosk down here, which is the constellation we would recognize as Cassiopeia, runs up and down through the Nash and carries malicious messages between the eagle and Nidhogg here at the end of the tree. Uh, the four stars, the four stags run in the branches of the ash and feed on the forage. And you can see Dane and Valen, Dunir and Duranthor. Uh, those are supposed to be four deer that run up and down in the branches. And then up here is another depiction of the Big Dipper, Hellwagon. Hello Wagon uh, is the constellation in the Norse tradition that's the wagon of the dead. And the wagon tra travels upon the Milky Way. And as it travels, it's carrying the dead to the underworld. Another very well known constellation, Orion, it's a winter constellation. You can best view this between November and February. Uh, is the home for many uh, inter interesting astronomical objects. For instance, the Horsehead Nebula is there and the red giant Betelgeuse uh, is also in this constellation and see it right there. Uh, the most interesting thing about that star is that it's gonna go supernova uh, fairly soon we believe. So it could be anywhere from tomorrow to the next 10, 20,000 years that, uh, that something dramatic is gonna happen with that star. Uh, the Brazilian Tucano people see the handle of a wooden carving tool in this constellation. Uh, the Arab, Arab, Aboriginal tribe Barang in Australia see the foot of a dancing man. Egyptians saw the father of the god Sa, and Macedonians were a farming culture, they saw a plow. In the Greek, in the Greek tradition, they saw Orion the great hunter. And in that story, I, Orion was a hunter with great skill. He provided meat each day for the gods' meals. And then one day, Ar Artemis, the moon goddess and goddess of the hunt, asked if she could accompany Orion on his daily hunt. And he readily agreed to this. The next day, as they were hunting in the woods, they saw a deer. And Orion fitted an arrow to his bow and shot at the deer. His shot was so sure that it, as soon as it hit the deer, the deer died instantly, which pleased Artemis greatly. At dinner that evening, Artemis told everyone, even Zeus, of Orion's great ability with the bow. All of the gods praised uh, Orion, and he was extremely happy with this, and he vowed to impress Artemis even more the next day. So Orion got, Orion got up early before the dawn and proceeded to hunt and he shot every animal that he found in the forest. He took all of these animals and made a large pile next to Artemis's house and then knocked on her door and asked her to come out to see the great surprise he had for her. When Artemis saw this huge pile of dead animals, she was horrified because Artemis was also the protector of animals and she punished anyone who killed more than they could eat. So she became very angry and stomped her foot on the ground and that produced a great scorpion. That scorpion stung Orion on, the, on his heel and caused him to die in great pain. But in honor of his great service to the gods, Zeus placed his constellation in the sky. And that's what we see uh, here. The Lakota people see a creature called Teyamani. Uh, the te head of Teyamani, at this end here is the constellation we would call the Pleiades. Uh, so this star cluster, even though it is uh, seven stars and it's known to 
uh, the Lakota Seven Sisters also, uh, it consists of one star in their constellation of Teyamani. So Teyamani has its head here. And then if you look here, you can see the constellation of Orion, which makes up its ribs and its backbone. And then down at this end is the bright star Sirius that makes up its tail. So in researching this, uh, this was pretty interesting. The, uh, the people who created this don't know what kind of creature this is. They don't know uh, if it is an, uh, they don't know what kind of creature it is. All they know is that it walks or crawls on the earth. It might swim in the water. It may fly through the air. All they know about it is that it has a head, a backbone, ribs, and a tail. Uh, but they, even they couldn't tell what kind of animal it was. Uh, one of the other more famous constellations is called Bootes. Uh, this is a late spring, early summer constellation. And many of the ancient civilizations said that this was a shepherd. Uh, it's also recognized by modern people more as a kite. And you can see that this area up here looks like a kite and Arcturus down here at the bottom would be the bottom of that kite, okay? Uh, the Romans called Bootes the herdsman and said that it herded the seven stars of the Big Dipper, which they saw as oxen around the celestial pole. Uh, and even uh, the Greeks had various stories for this. So two of those stories uh, are one where it is called the bear driver. So it's Bootes the bear driver. And according to the Greeks, uh, they pictured him as a mighty man. And in his right hand, he held a spear. And with his left hand, he held two hunting dogs. And he appears to be pursuing the great bear, Ursa Major, around the North Pole. So that's why he was called the bear driver. The key star, Arcturus, uh, is found, you can find that pretty easily by following the handle of the uh, Big Dipper and it arches around and down uh, and will line up with Arcturus down here at the bottom. Uh, Arcturus is one of the oldest stars that has been named uh, and it even is named in the Bible. It's known as Job star. So in the book of Job, it's even talked about. Here's another story from the Greeks uh, where they called Arcturus the plowman. And the story goes that he was a farmer in ancient Greece. Back then there was enough food for people uh, because they didn't have enough people to work the fields. And people were hungry every day. So Bootes every day would go out and he'd dig up his fields to make rows for his crops. It was hard work and he's, he's thinking to himself, surely there's gotta be an easier way for me to farm. And one night he stayed up late after everyone else went to bed and he's thinking about how to make tilling of his field easier. And after thinking about several ideas, he settled on one and got to work on, on making it. And the next morning when it was time to till his field, he used his new invention, which was the wagon and the plow. And he was able to finish his fields faster than and easier than anyone else. So when the neighboring farmers heard about this, they all lined up for miles in front of his house and asked him to build one for them. And so all of the farmers started working on uh, their fields with this new wagon and plow, and they were able to produce enough for everyone. And here you can see the uh, Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. So this would be uh, the wagon and the plow that he would pull uh, behind him and plow his fields. And because of his service to the farmers, the gods decided to put his constellation in the stars. Uh, in, ancient China, our, uh, in ancient China, Arcturus, known as Dei Zhao, which is the great horn, marks the horn at the end of the blue dragon. It's said to symbolize, also symbolize the throne of the celestial king, Tain Wang, who is visualized as holding court in this area. Although it's not clear how this character differs from either the terrestrial emperor or the supreme sky god. That seems to be, they use that interchangeably. 
The star status comes about not just because it's the brightest in the northern half of the sky, but also because it lies in the first lunar mansion, Jowl, where the full moon appears each spring, marking the start of the year. Uh, additionally, it is in line with the handle of the Big Dipper, which is used as a seasonal clock hand in the sky. Uh, so Arcturus or Day Jow becoming associated with the annual cycle of the seasons. And that's a powerful symbol uh, of cosmic, cosmic harmony in the Chinese culture. Uh, while it's not a constellation, Pleiades figures in a lot of stories in different cultures. Uh, the Pleiades is in the constellation of Taurus. You can see it here. Oh, hold on. Uh, you can see it up here, uh, the Pleiades. And it is often confused with the Little Dipper. So you can see here on the right is the Pleiades, and it looks very much like the Little Dipper. Uh, the difference is obviously it's a lot smaller, and the Little Dipper has at the end of it uh, this star, which is Polaris, and this star is always in the same spot. It's called the North Star. And in our night sky, it doesn't move uh, enough where you would notice it. So from November through April, the open star cluster known as the Pleiades uh, is visible. The Mapache people of Southern Chile see freshly dug potatoes. Uh, they use this set of stars to help predict what the weather is going to be. Uh, Siberians see a duck's nest of eggs. And then native people of Greenland see a patch of dogs surrounding a polar bear. And the Tupi people see a white ostrich. Uh, in the Greek story, after Atlas, Atlas was forced to carry the heavens on his shoulders, Orion saw his opportunity to pr pursue Atlas's seven daughters, which we know as the Pleiades. Zeus, to protect the seven sisters, first transformed them into doves. Uh, but that didn't stop Orion. Orion continued to pursue them. Zeus then turned them into stars and set them in the sky to comfort their father Atlas. The constellation Orion is, if you look at the constellation Orion though, it looks like it's still pursuing uh, the Pleiades across the night sky. Uh, the car company Subaru uses the Pleiades as their corporate logo. Uh, in Japanese, it means coming together or cluster. So as this is a star cluster, that makes sense. And the, Sub the Subaru car company used the Pleiades to represent the six different car com companies that were brought together to form one, which we now know as the Subaru uh, car company. Uh, the Japanese also use Subaru to name their uh, observatory on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Uh, this is a picture of it that uh, mountain you see in the background really isn't a mountain. It's a shadow of the mountain uh, as the sun is rising there. So the uh, Japanese used Subaru also to name their observatory there. Uh, Native American tribes called the Kiowa tell a long time ago in the fall before they came south, they were camped on a stream in the far north where there are a great many bears. One day, seven little girls were playing at a distance from the village and were chased by some bears. The girls started running towards the village, but the bears were just about to catch them and they knew they weren't going to escape. So they jumped on a rock about three feet high and one of the girls prayed to the rock. She said, rock, take pity on us. Rock, save us. And the rock heard them and it began to grow upwards, pushing the girls higher and higher. When the bears jumped to reach the girls, they scratched the rock, broke their claws and fell to the ground. But the rock continued to rise higher and higher and the bear, bears still jumped at the girls until they were pushed up so high in the sky that they became seven little stars in a group. When the people came to look for the girls, they found the bears claws turned to stone all around the base of what today is called Devil's Tower in Wyoming, which you may recognize here. Uh, in the winter, uh, if you go to Devil's Tower, in the middle of the night, the seven stars, known as the Pleiades, actually is right overhead of this large rock. Uh, in the last story that I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to return to the Great Bear. And this is told by the Ininu, 
what we call the Cree uh, Native Americans of North America. The Cree tell a story of the great bear, Mr. Musqua, and the seven birds. A long time ago, there were huge bears that roamed the country, and they were everywhere. They were so big that they did whatever they wanted to do, and everything feared them. The largest bear realized after many years that as he went from place to place, he would be given offerings and donations. And after a while, he came to expect these offerings and donations. If he came to a place and he was not given anything, he would throw a fit. Eventually, he stopped getting the donations because of his behavior, and he stopped expecting them. Now, when he went someplace, he would not wait for anyone to give him a donation or offering. He would simply take what he wanted. And in the process, many beings were killed. Sometimes the bear would go into a camp and rip up a person and steal the winter supplies. And the people there would starve during the winter. This went on for a long time. And eventually it was decided that they had to get rid of the bear. A meeting was held and the seven best hunters and trackers were given the task of tracking down the bear and getting rid of him. Now the seven selected for this task were birds and they were just small birds, but they took on the task and started tracking the bear. Now the raven, the crow and the magpie were carrion birds and scavengers. And they learned that if they followed the great bear, they would always have plenty of what, of what the bear left behind. The raven, crow, and magpie learned of the little birds hunting the great bear and warmed him. And when the great bear learned that he was being hunted, he did what any good bully would do. He ran away. The little birds chased the bear. And as the hunt went on, they all ran faster and faster. And the, the hunt went on for so long that they circumnav circumnavigated the globe four times. By then it was autumn and they were going so fast that they flew into the air. Now the bear was tired and he turned to face his attackers. And when he turned, the lead bird shot an arrow and hit the bear in the neck, mortally wounding him. The bear shook like a dog when it comes out of the water. And as the bear shook, the blood from his neck fell on the ground and on all the broadleaf plants. And that's why in the autumn, leaves change color. It's from the bear's blood. Now, as the bear continued to shake, a drop of blood hit the lead bird's chest, turning it red. And that bird was Pipisiu, the robin. To honor that bird, the creator gave that bird a special egg, the color of the sky. And on the egg were speckles to remind us of the stars. He then placed the birds and the bear in the sky and arranged it so the bear is perpetually watching the birds. The moral of this story is that the smallest being can bring down the largest and that should, you should not abuse your power. So that's the last story for this evening. I, there, that's just a few of them. There's obviously star stories from all kinds of country, cultures all around the world. And if anyone is of any age looking for more information, uh, two books that I highly recommend are Find the Constellations and the Stars. Both of these are by the author H.A. Ray. And if you don't recognize it, he is the same author that created Curious George. Okay, and here's the sources that I used for this uh, particular talk. And with that, I'll go ahead and end this and ask if there are any questions. Anybody have any questions? All right, thank you, David. That was so great. I really enjoyed those stories. Thank you, Shirley. Um, if anybody is wanting the secret word for the summer reading program, um, it is bear. So you can add that to your bean stack if you'd like. All right. Thank you so much, David. Thanks, Shirley. I appreciate it. <laughs>